Hello and welcome back to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube page. My name is Kyle Boone, a.k.a. Strongjaw, and we're going to talk some ball today. The NBA draft is officially two weeks away from today as of Wednesday, and I'm joined by Mr. Adam Finkelstein himself, uh, Director of Scouting for 247 Sports, Insider for CBS Sports HQ. What other uh, nicknames... Titles do we have for you, Mr. Fink? None that none of that are appropriate for a family-oriented show. Oh boy. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to have a fun episode today because today we're gonna flesh out an idea pitched by one of our editors, Trey Scott, on um a true false. Just looking through some of the different players in this class. We have six true falses, and then we're gonna finish with uh, kind of a teaser on your latest mock draft, which dropped on CBSSports.com earlier this week. Go check it out. I also have my two-round mock draft, uh, which by the time you listen to this podcast episode or this YouTube show, will already be out on CBSSports.com. Um, let's start here with the first true-false. Um, and I will pitch it straight to you, Mr. Finkelstein. True or false? And you know how true or false works, okay? So you're going to pick either true or false, and you're going to explain why you believe one way or the other. And I will offer a rebuttal or I'll offer an agreement. Uh, true or false, Donovan Klingon is worth the number one pick in the 2024 NBA draft. False. Um, and it's not a statement about who he is as a basketball player. It's a statement about the market. And I believe if Atlanta decides that Donovan Klingon is the player they want, they would be able to trade down, get him slightly lower in the lottery, and pick up another asset. Um, this is something that that I talked about in my mock and and that and also yesterday on the 24-7 sports show. Um, but it's a strategy we've seen before. We saw Boston do it very famously when they didn't want Markel Fultz and they wanted Jason Tatum. Last year, it was more subtle, but we saw Indiana do it when they wanted Jairus Walker and they swapped with Washington, uh, moved down one slot, picked up an asset. So I, I think it's if Atlanta decides they want Klingon, they can get him and pick up another asset without having to take him at number one. What okay. do you think? No, I like that. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to swerve and go the other direction. I think he is worth the number one pick. I think there's uh, three, maybe four players in this class who I could – make a case for being worth the number one pick, Zachary Risache, Alex Saar, Donovan Klingon, and Stefan Castle. Um, and I did kind of our prospect uh, capsules for CBS Sports, and that will be um, live on the prospect rankings landing page probably in the next week. Uh, but doing that, I actually had to hand out like ratings for each player. Yeah. 100 through 96 is a future Hall of Famer. 95 through 90, future All-Star. 89 through 85, high-level starter, so on and so forth. So you started at an 89 in this class or what? Yeah, basically. Like it, it's there's not any 96 or above, I'll tell you that. Uh, but I yeah, I ended up having Klingon like very, very high and and pretty close to where I have Risache, uh Sar, and of course Castle, who I'm higher on than most. Where and is he on your big board? Because he was lower a, a, a month or so ago, right? Yeah, so I have Klingon. I have Castle right now um, at number two, okay. uh, and and Klingon is at number four. Okay. So this was this was a useful exercise for me because I felt like okay, I really don't value the center position a whole lot when I'm just evaluating prospects just in a in kind of a vacuum, but I have a whole lot of confidence in projecting Donovan Klingon, and I think he has potential to be an All Star. Like the defense is going to translate. I think his high-end outcome is like a potential Rudy Gobert-type defensive anchor. And, you know, I, I think I find myself prioritizing guards uh, just in general because of how the NBA is, is structured right now, guards and wings, uh, because of how the NBA is, is, is played. But Klingon, I think there's a whole lot of confidence that, like, at, at worst, he's going to be like a really high-level starter, I think. So... The, the floor there for Donovan Klingon, I think, is very, very high. And then if he's able to add the shooting, able to add some more dynamism on offense, then I think you're you're potentially talking about the number one player in this class. I would not take him with the number one pick. Uh, but, you know, if, if Atlanta just decided, hey, look, 
we're not even going to trade down and pick up assets and take Klingon at, you know, say three or whatever. We're just going to take Donovan Klingon at number one because we think he's the best player. Um, I wouldn't totally be terribly shocked. And he's, I, I think he could end up being the best player from this class. So true. I do believe he is right. worth one pick in this class. All right. Fair enough. Okay. Let's move on to another UConn guy, uh, Stefan Castle who I think we're both high on, have been high on throughout the draft process. You're uh, higher than I am, to be honest, and my, my alma mater is going to be upset with me today, but you're you're higher than I am. Okay, good, good. Um, so I'm curious to see how you answer this question. Is Stefan Castle a point guard? Well, we got to phrase it like a true false, right? True or false? Is he a point guard? True? Uh, false. So Stefan Castle is a point guard is the statement. My response is false um he is capable of playing on or off the ball but he played the three this year at UConn he was the third ball handler Tristan Newton Cam Spencer Sandy are off the bench they were all more of a ball handler than Stefan Castle was he played with the ball in his hands in high school um but he was at his best on the wing game's easier when the defense rotates it makes your makes your pick and roll reads your your pick and roll attack your straight line drives um, the defense is already scrambling a little bit, makes the game a little easier. Um, but ultimately, the value in Stefan Castle is someone who can play and defend multiple positions, I think one through three. Um, so I say false because I do not believe he's a pure point guard, but I think he's someone who can uh, play and defend multiple positions. What do you got? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go with it's partly true, partly false. Uh, that's that's my. No, uh, no, no. You said, and when you describe the rules, when you described the rules, you said that we couldn't, we had to pick one or the other. I look, I let you I let you cop out answers all the time on this show. I know, which is why I'm playing by your rules. I, I didn't preface the Donovan Kling and said, Well, you know, I didn't do that. I didn't do it with Castle. I just said false. Yukon okay. hates me now. I can't go back to my alma mater. They got new restaurants there. They got the Yukon Dairy Barn. Have you ever heard of the Yukon Dairy Barn? I can't go there anymore because of this podcast. And now you want to hedge your bets. Does that does right. it sell, sell ice cream? What is the Yukon? Yeah, Dairy? big time ice cream. Yeah. Okay. I'm a huge ice cream guy. Chocolate ice cream. Um, Come on over to stores, man. Yeah, You're going to be make, welcome there after this pod. Whew, let me make a quick trip over there. Um, yeah. Okay. Stefan Castle's a point guard. I think he is. And... Look, he's not like I don't. I don't think he's going to be a primary number one option, but I don't think it really matters. I, th I think you're applying labels to that. to um, you know someone who you know in the NBA. Like, there's a lot of positionless basketball going on, um, and I think Stephon Castle, his defense is amazing. He was consistently you know picking up the the best offensive player on the other team for UConn this season. A team that oh by the way. Won 37 games and won its second consecutive national championship. Uh, Castle showed some offensive playmaking. I think he has some untapped vision. Is he going to be the number one playmaking option? No. And, you know, if the answer is no, then maybe my answer should be false. He's not a point guard. But I, I don't think it really even matters. Like, I did a comp earlier this week for HQ um, where I think he could be like a Drew Holiday. Someone who's really, really good on defense can yeah. consistently pick up um, full court and and just be a total pain in the neck on defense. And then offensively, like there's some playmaking. Drew Holiday is a really good passer. He's someone who can create off the dribble and and distribute at a high level. I, I'm not necessarily sure that people see Drew Holiday as like a true number one point guard, but his playmaking, his passing is absolutely point guard esque, and so that's where I think Stefan Castle, like if he hits his ceiling, um, he could be like a supercharged version of Drew Holiday. So I like that. That's that's in part why I'm very high on Stefan Castle, and and obviously becomes Drew Holiday. That's a tremendous like career outcome for him. I think. Yeah, yeah. All right, I like that. That's a good. That's a good case. Okay. Thank you for lot, not letting me cop out on that. I really tried hard, but yeah, I, I had to, pick to one. hold the line over here. Trying to hold the line. I know. All right. Number three, Reed Shepard. True or false is the best shooter in the 2024 NBA draft class. Man, can I cop out on this one? Please. Um, what? Please do. I'll let you for a second and then I'm going to call All right. So here, here's what I will say. If you only watched him in Kentucky, your answer is true. You're, yeah. you're citing the, the shooting splits, 
the movement shooting, some of the tough shot making, all of which are 100% valid. If you watched him uh, for more than just this last year, or you have access to the data from his high school years, this is a tough question. Because while everything I just said about what happened in Kentucky is 100% legitimate, it is a bit of an outlier in terms of the total sample size. Now, listen, everybody gets better. Most people, hopefully, you get better as a shooter as you get older. But Reed Shepard's numbers in high school um, were nowhere near what we saw at Kentucky. He was something like a, a career 33% three-point shooter. Now, the caveat being is that was in games that were, were tracked on uh, different things like synergy. So you're talking about his games in, in 3SSB with Midwest Basketball Club. You're talking about his games um, that that made it onto that syn synergy platform, um, the video database that also stats all the games. Um, that's not every game he ever played, but the vast majority of the time when he was in those biggest settings in high school, he was not a driller. I mean, so... The shooting numbers that we saw this year um, were a big surprise to those of us who followed him as closely as, as we did in high school. Um, and, and I don't even see, I, I think there's some some subtle stuff mechanically that he that he tweaked or maybe honed in on. But more than anything, I think it was about confidence and just playing in rhythm and um, not worrying, not not worrying about like having to live up to a reputation. So I know I, I just went on that rant about having to hold the line. I don't know is the answer if he's the best shooter or not. I'm tempted to say false um, until the sample size proves otherwise. But truth be told, when he started shooting the ball at this rate in, in November and December, I never thought that it was sustainable and it proved to be sustainable. Yeah. yeah. Um, better shooter as you get older. I found that is absolutely not the case. Um Man, I played some pickup basketball last night, and I think I just threw so many bricks at the at the backboard. I mean, you can get the quirks, right? I mean, we could go on like a deep dive, like a, a Johnny Davis, like you know, and and several others. I mean, you can you can get the shanks. I think, right? That's what they call it in golf. You can get the shanks, but yeah, I, most maybe, of the time, guys get better. Yeah, sure. Yeah, maybe that's true. Um, no, I think I think the Reed Shepherd shooting numbers are pretty hard to ignore. Um, Obviously, I did not scout him in high school. We leave that to uh, to your expertise. So I think it's worth taking into account the full picture of what he has been prior to college. But man, what he was in college was pretty dang good, right? I mean, yes, it was. He, he rated in 100th percentile, according to Synergy, in jump shots as a true freshman at Kentucky. And you know, maybe there's, there's something to the fact that he had the pressure taken off of him somewhat. Uh, he came off the bench almost the entire season for Kentucky. He played next to, you know, Rob Dillingham and Antonio Reeves, which took a ton of attention and pressure off of him. DJ Wagner. DJ Wagner was supposed to be the guy at the beginning of the year. Yep. Um, he was 99th percentile on catch and shoot, uh, 99th percentile on dribble jumpers. He made 52.1% of his three-pointers, uh, which, of course, led college basketball. I, I think... That being said, I think the answer is false. I'm really? gonna I'm okay. gonna agree with you because I was watching some Jared McCain, and maybe I'm deep in the Jared McCain wormhole at this point, but I think it may be Jared McCain as the best shooter in this draft, just based on his ability to be a true knockdown movement shooter. Um mm. McCain does an excellent job of kind of sprinting to his spots, getting square, and then just firing. Just yeah, it's terrific. McCain has terrific balance in his mechanics. He, his weight is always equally distributed. Even when he's on the move, he, he's got a way of getting his feet set and being straight up and down. That's that's impressive. I agree with that. Yeah, yeah that like absolutely stands out to me. He never he never looks like he's forcing it. Even when he's uncomfortable, he looks comfortable um, and just is always able to square his shoulders off the catch. Um, you know, I think he keeps it in the shooting pocket and then unloads. Reed, when I watch Shepard off the catch, he's not quite as quick. Um, he's not quite as rhythmic. He brings it down a little bit before he's unleashing. And those are like, you know, maybe like small tweaks that Shepard can make. Um, it, you know, and certainly if you look at the shooting numbers last season, Reed Shepard was a better shooter than Jared McCain. But I think in the NBA, I believe Jared McCain will end up being a better shooter uh, than than Reed Shepard, so I will go false here. I believe Jared okay. McCain is the best shooter in the draft. I like it. Good. It's debatable. I think we can end on there. It's debatable for sure. For sure. Yeah. 
Um, let's move to the next one. Number four, Bronny James will be the number 17 pick in the 2024 NBA draft, or he will be a first round pick. So either he's going to the Lakers or he'll go somewhere in the top 30 picks. False. 55 to the Lakers, plain and simple. Okay, false. I think he goes in the second round, but I'm not going to spoil it. You got to go check out my two round mock draft on CBS Sports.com. Do you have anybody else but the Lakers taking him? I know. I, you I do. I do. Do I you do. really? Yes. 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 So that you, you recognize that that team will never again be able to sign a player from clutch ever again, right? Okay. Here's my, here's my teaser for my mock draft. Okay. Can I go, can I go look at this now? Go ahead. I'm clicking while you do this. You talk. It's not, it's not even published yet, uh, ah, since, okay. uh, but I'm just, I'm just projecting that uh, Bronny takes his talents to South Beach. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Oh, yeah, they did. He and Savannah, what was that? They said, um, yeah, we miss we yeah. miss living in Miami. I don't I just don't see Pat Riley doing that. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you I'm think wrong. you think Pat Riley gives two craps about what LeBron and the Clutch family thinks? I mean, maybe. Oh, you think this is just like a vindictive Pat Riley move? No, I, I think it's legitimately a, like oh, that's a, juicy. a basketball decision. Like he just was like. You know what? I like LeBron. I like Bronny James as a prospect. I don't care that it's going to make some people mad. We are one of the best developmental franchises in the NBA. We have one of the best coaches in the NBA. I think he could become something. And yeah, it's going to look vindictive because we're going to take him a couple picks before the Lakers. But, uh, you know, there's some familiarity there. Bronny's obviously lived in Miami before. I think it could work out. Um, and I think it'd be a really fun storyline to see play out. Well, it is a fun storyline. I'm I'm waiting. What time is this dropping? I'm 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 on the page right now. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh I just got a message from Ben Kirchwall who is editing right now. So maybe within the next couple hours. Definitely by the time okay. you listen to this, it'll be out. Um got it. All right. Fifth and penultimate true false for this show. Zach Eady. Two-time National Player of the Year award, award winner for Purdue will be an NBA starter. True or false? False. Um, yeah. At least not not consistently. I think it's possible, um, but I think it's going to depend on how the game itself evolves. If we see a game that slows down, gets more physical, and starts to be played inside out again, um, then I think he's got a better chance. But based on the way the NBA game is constructed now. And this is even recognizing that I think we're, we're the pendulum is swinging away from freedom of movement and things like that. If you're watching these NBA playoffs, there's a lot of contact in this game again that was not necessarily allowed in the last two or three years. So it's getting more physical. But um, I think Zach Eady is ideally suited to be a backup big man who can give you about you know 12 to maybe 20 minutes a game. And I recognize he played all 48 down at the, the NCAA tournament, um, but is going to be exclusively a drop coverage big man. So that means that if you want to guard pick and roll any other way, he can't be your five man. Um, so it really limits the versatility and your options if you're coaching him. And if you have a defensive system that's that's predicated on any kind of you know change of pace with your ball screen defense, um, Zach Eady is, is going to limit that. So... That's the basic reason. Um, I, I love Zach Eady. I, let me just say this because I know you're a big fan and you're probably going to say true. Um, so let me just say, I think while I'm skeptical that he's a starting center in the NBA, that has more to do with the NBA style of play than it does with Zach Eady because I think we need to give him a ton of credit for the continued progression he's made. He just keeps getting better year in, year in and year out. And most of all, I think that is related to his conditioning, because for a guy that size to be able to log 40 minutes a night in the NCAA tournament deep in the season for, for Purdue was exceptionally impressive. So this is not Zach Eady hate. I think I've I think I've answered false to all of these. It, it's just a commentary about the importance of being able to guard ball screens in different ways in the NBA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I co-signed everything that you just said. I love Zach Eady as a prospect. I loved watching Zach Eady and covering Zach Eady as a player at Purdue. I'm not entirely confident that he's going to be a starter in the NBA. And that's not a knock on Zach Eady. Hmm. Um, yeah, I just think, you know, when I when I did my grading system, he fell somewhere between 80 to 84, which is starter, not high level starter, but starter. He dropped on your board, right? He's he's he, I wouldn't say he's dropped. Uh, he's consistently been like in the 20 to 30 range. 
Okay. Okay. I thought he was higher. My bad. Um, I've, I've had him mocked a few times, like in anywhere between like 14 and 25. Okay. Uh, just because I think the NBA may be higher on him than, than maybe I am. Uh, but I, I, I have him graded as basically a part time player which is 79 to 75. Like, I think he can be a useful rotation piece. I think he's probably more of a like specialty type player, a specialty big, someone who's going to dominate inside. There's, there's obviously some limits in terms of his movement skills, what he's going to be able to do when he's sliding his feet and, and defending yeah. out in space. Um, but you know, I, I still, I still buy the fact that, you know, maybe his game doesn't, seamlessly translate maybe he's more of an old school big man but there's a lot of stuff he does really really well that mm -hmm. i think some of it's going to translate he's he's not going to be a, a future starter someone who's going to be an all-star but i do think he's going to be a useful nba player not, I, probably a lot of people are just writing him off in general um entirely just because of the fact that he has more of an old school game I'm definitely not of that belief. I think he will end up having a, a decently fruitful NBA career, uh, just not buying that he's going to be an NBA starter. Okay. Okay. I think we're on the same page there. I like it. Uh, number six, last true false, and then we'll get to uh, your, your latest mock draft here. The best player in the draft will end up being the number one pick. Now, that's not always the case. Uh, this is a surprise I, question. This was not on the, this is not on the schedule. Um, false. I'll right. take, the, I'll take the field. Um, okay. I, I would take the field unless you got a Wemby, I would take the field almost every year. And I think history would back us up there because there's always somebody, uh, that's going to come out who's going to be way better than expected. So, um, yeah. and I'm actually writing about this on CBS shortly, going back to that 2013 NBA draft and Basically, how do you find the sleeper? Because whether it's Giannis at 13 or Jokic in the second round or Jalen Brunson in the second round, like every draft for the last 10 years, and you can't really say this for, for the, um, the most recent years because it hasn't played out yet, but every draft has somebody who develops into an all-star who no one was projecting on draft night. Yep. And so I went back from like 2011, 2020 and found that guy in each draft and tried to find some common denominators. And the common denominator is, I mean, it can be a few different things. If listen, if I had the common denominator, I'd go be the GM somewhere instead of hanging with you. Although this is clearly more fun. Um, but it, it's so, yeah, I'll take the field. I, I, regardless of who the number one pick is, I do believe there's someone in there who's going to end up being an all-star who we're not talking about right now. And the biggest re reason why I believe that is because it happens each and every year. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you go back to last year, Victor Wiminyama. Duh. But it's mostly uh, kind of a toss up if you kind of look historically. I mean, you know, 2019, Zion, Ja, RJ, that class. Uh, 2018, you had DeAndre Ayton going number one. Luca was number three. Um, 2017, Markel Fultz, number one pick. Jason Tatum falls to number three. So, yeah, I will, uh, man, I hate to agree with you, Fink. You're making some good but points. I mean, Boone, like, even, even, somebody outside the lottery so i'm just i'm just picking up this this story now so like 2011 jimmy butler goes 30th yeah um 2012 draymond green goes 35th 2013 we talked about Giannis, and then um rudy gobert 2014 Jokic goes 41st 2015 devin booker goes 15th 2016 pascal siakam goes 27th 2017 Bam Adebayo goes 14th. 2018, Jalen Brunson goes 33rd. So it, it's it's going to be in here somewhere, and it's going to be somebody that we're not talking about. It's just a matter of – and it's I would even say the best player is not going to be taken in the top three. I think, like, that's Ooh. – certainly that's more likely, but um, there's a really good chance in this draft that, um, that I think the best player is someone that we're – 10 years from now is someone we're not talking about right now. I like it. That's bold. Uh, I'm going to put your feet to the fire then. Who's the who in five years we look back in this draft class and say, oh, he's he's he was actually the best player and he went not number one. You could say, you know, Alex Sarr at number two or Cody Williams at 15. Who's your uh, get out your crystal ball and tell me who you think is is going to end up in five years being the best player from this class. 
So this was the to your previous point. There, there was. Um, this is the subject of of the article I'm writing on CBS and trying to identify these players. What I'll, I will tease it by saying, two of the players I'm intrigued with, and I won't elaborate on why, is Devin Carter uh-huh. and um, Tijan Sal- Saloon. Did I say that right? Salon. Yeah, Talon. Whatever you say yeah. it for me. Tijan Salon. To John Salon, Devin Carter and to John Salon are two of the ones um, that I think have some commonalities with some of these players who were taken outside the lottery or outside the top 10 who ended up going on to be all stars. So okay. those are two that I'm interested in. I like it. I like that a lot. Um, I will go with uh, Stefan Castle, my boy, my large adult son. I think he will end up being the best player from this class. He's not the number one pick in this class. Uh, but by golly, in five years, we will say, whoo, Kyle was right. He was the best player in this class. I hope that's right. Gosh, please clip this for next. Somebody hold his milk. Oh, man. Oh, man. Please, please, please. All right. Uh, last question here, Fink, and we'll get out of here on this. Uh, yeah. you, you have a mock draft that is on CBSSports.com. It is already published. My mock draft will publish later today. Um, you've got some spicy, spicy stuff in your mock draft. You think so? I- yeah, I mean, everything's spicy. I love all mock drafts. Um, Sar, number one, you have Donovan Klingen at number two. Risa Shea falling to three. Uh, tell me, of all 30 picks, who your favorite fit is uh, of your projected mock draft that is uh, that is now up again on CBSSports.com. So, like, let's go outside the top five, so to speak, and, and let's talk about Bub Carrington because yeah. – Bub Carrington, and if you go back on this very channel, you can watch our breakdown of the best guards in the draft. We didn't even talk Bub Carrington. Yeah. And I think Bub Carrington is a name that has consistently risen in the draft process in terms of what teams think throughout the last couple of months. And specifically at the NBA Combine, we heard a lot of um, a lot of things about Bub Carrington. And. I think that Orlando is in a position where you look at some of the people they've drafted in the backcourt in recent years. They've got Markel Fultz. They obviously didn't draft him, Philadelphia, but um, they've got Fultz. They've got Cole Anthony. They've got Anthony Black. They've got a lot of young guards there. Jalen Suggs is probably the only one who's like, okay, we see him as a long-term starter based on the, the jump he made last year on the defensive end of the floor, first and foremost. But like, who is that next guy? Bub Carrington is not ready yet. He's not going to come in. He's someone who's probably going to be in the G League a little bit next year. Um, but long-term, when you start projecting him out, the size, the the gains he made last year at Pittsburgh, this is a player who was way better last year than I or anyone who saw him in high school could have ever expected. And as I've talked about on this show before, that is a huge indicator for me, the rate of improvement. When I see someone making huge strides year in and year out, I'm projecting on that growth to continue. Um, And so Bub Carrington, I just think, is going to have a a linear development for years to come. And I think Orlando is a place where they've taken a lot of swings and trying to figure out who their guards are of the future. But Bub could make a lot of sense um, lining up in that spot. I like it. Yeah, I like it. And he's up to number 18 in your mock draft. Uh, Not someone who entered the season as a projected uh, future first round, but had a great, great season with Pittsburgh. Uh, as a freshman, now one and done. Uh, I'm going to go with my favorite fit as the pick right before Bub Carrington. Uh, number 17, Tristan De Silva to the Lakers. And, you know, he's six foot eight, combo forward, averaged 16 points per game last season for Colorado, shot 40% from three point range and was really, really good in the NCAA tournament for the Buffaloes. The Lakers obviously are in win now mode um, forever. And, um, you know, so long as LeBron is there, I don't see them hitting the reset um, anytime soon. He's someone who I think could be plug and play. Um, he's, he's really dynamic as, uh, as, a, as a scorer, as a shooter, um, great size. I think defensively he'll hold up well. So I think that's a really good fit. I would also highlight here um, Nikola Topic falling to number 12. I think that's an interesting uh, pick in your mock draft as well to the Thunder. Uh, this is a guy who's number five on the CBS Sports Big Board right now. Um, it's not updated post ACL injury. Um, he has a partial tear of his ACL in his left knee, um, which, as we wrote on CBSSports.com earlier this week together, 
um, mm-hmm. could impact his his draft stock. But you know, I think if you getting a potential top five prospect in this class at number twelve in your Oklahoma City, you might jump on it. You know, he's he's one of the best playmakers in this class. Next year might be a redshirt year for him. But um, OKC doesn't have a ton of holes to fill. And, and if they do, you know, I think they could fill them in free agency. And then, you know, a year from now, they're looking at Topic as, you know, a guy that you can throw into a really, really deep rotation. So, yeah, both of those, I think, are they, um, they can afford they can afford to wait on him, Boone, too. You got a lot of general managers in this lottery who kind of need to show progress to their owners just for their own kind of, you know, job status. So. OKC Sam Presti is not one of those guys the the OKC roster like they can afford to stash this pick and say you know what go get the surgery we'll see you in a year they did it with Chet Holmgren obviously that wasn't a choice um, but they don't have any holes in the any glaring holes that they need to address in their rotation next year and the other thing that I really like about this this fit is that he gets the paint touches that OKC likes and if Josh Giddy isn't like the long-term solution there like, I don't want to say he's just like Giddy because he's more of a point guard, but he's got that backcourt size and that versatility where he could plug a very similar role and potentially move in for Giddy if they ever uh, end up dealing him. Yep, absolutely. And uh, the Giddy situation is going to be interesting because I believe he will be extension eligible in the near future. So OKC will probably have to make some sort of decision on him um relatively soon i would imagine so that that kind of adds an element of you know maybe they take a swing and go for topic as well um there's some interesting uh other prospects out there my my mock draft has kyle filipowski because they need size they, they need some more shooting um yes yeah, that that could be real i've heard they like him yeah jared mccain would be an interesting one he was apparently spotted in oklahoma city this week uh deron holmes okc fans love him i think that would be a little bit high for me I, but yeah I, I like Deron Holmes quite a bit. I think that would make a lot of sense. So it's going to be interesting. It, you can find Fink's mock draft, again, on CBSports.com. My mock draft, by the time you listen to this, will be on CBSports.com. Mr. Finkelstein, thank you for hanging out, talking ball with me. Boom. Let's go. Uh, that's it for today. We will catch you guys next week. Be sure you are subscribed to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube page. I got to do that. Hold on. Do it now. Yeah. Yeah. Do it now. Come on. It's really Come easy. On. Yeah. All right. Done. And we'll see you next time. Take care.